sympathy for child molesters, but I do have some grave doubts about putting people in jail because of their taste in pictures. I, you know, it is a real issue of personal liberty and to what extent we put people in jail for doing something which, in which they do not harm another person. They don't. That. Boo! Oh my goodness. That's disgusting. Tom Flanagan's faux pas. Some people call it a faux pas because he's got a PhD. If he were just anyone else, they would just say it's Tom Flanagan's nonsense or foolishness. Anyway, he invites academic debate over what he calls child pornography voyeurs, uh, just people of a strange taste in pictures. Um, he invites a dialogue over how society should be dealing with those who consume child porn, suggesting that counseling uh, might be better for them than potential jail time. Now, he's apologized. He offered an apology of sorts. But he keeps trying to say the same thing over and over again, just digging himself a deeper end to, to justify his remarks. Child porn, or should I say recorded child abuse, which is what it is, rape and torture crimes for the mutual gratification of pedophiles. He's not, in my mind, and I don't think yours, an academic issue or a theoretical issue. It's a crime issue and a pain issue and an abuse issue. Crime, pain, and abuse felt by real kids. It's not a theory. Their most agonizing moments of their lives replayed over and over again for the pleasure of sick criminals. We discussed this on the show yesterday. Despite the best efforts by authorities, it's a growing problem. More victims, younger kids, as young as one in some cases, and the attacks more brutal. Anyone who watches, whether they commit actual assaults or not, is an accomplice in these crimes. Now, yesterday we were joined by Ellen Campbell, from the Canadian Centre for Abuse Awareness to discuss the scourge of child pornography. And at any one time on the internet you can find over two million pictures of children under the age of two. And these are children that are being tortured and obviously not wanting things done to them that are done to them. And um, healthy people just don't look at child pornography. It becomes an addictive behaviour and like any addiction you need more and more and more and eventually the pictures aren't enough and then you start to act out and um, I remember a few years ago Holly Jones, a sto you know, story of a young girl here that was murdered and dismembered and the fellow that was, you know, abused her just, just before he abducted her was watching child pornography. So there's a real connection between child pornography and actually acting the acts out once uh, it it's in incites them. Any suggestion to soften up uh, any area around the enforcement of child protection is just flat out wrong. The damage done to the psyche of our law enforcement officers who have to actually watch the evidence, that alone is worth mandatory jail time. Unfortunately, most of these victims remain unidentified. So your question is, how can I help? We're here to help you find an answer. Joining us is Signe Arneson from Cybertip.ca. Cybertip.ca. CA, Canada's tip line to report the online sexual exploitation of children. Before we talk about uh, your organization, I want to give you a, a platform uh, to push back on. It's not, just, it's not just Flanagan. I wish it was just Flanagan. But there are a bunch of Flanagans out there, mm -hmm. uh, academics uh, who think that uh, those of us who oppose them are emotional, uh, irrational, aren't as uh, educated as, as they are about this important area of mm -hmm. civil liberties. Your chance. Well, I mean, the viewing of child pornography is not a passive act. You know, we're talking, as you had mentioned earlier, about very graphic images of pe people being, children being sexually abused and assaulted, in some cases raped and tortured. I mean, it gets I extremely concerning, especially when you look at the ages of the children within these images. We're not talking about youth and healthy sexual exploration and images ending up on the Internet. We're talking about crime scenes we're talking about children being abused and individuals viewing this and playing a significant role in fueling the demand for producing more of these images, re-victimizing these children every single time the images are viewed, and arguably present a very grave risk to escalate from fantasy to hands-on assault against these kids. So it's not, uh, it doesn't operate in a silo. 
and uh, there are grave impacts surrounding just the viewing of child pornography. I wouldn't give uh, Flanagan and uh, the Flanagan wannabes, the rationalizers, I wouldn't give them five minutes mm -hmm. of my time, your time, the time of the show. Mm -hmm. The only reason I do is because certain governments, certain legal authorities actually take them seriously and they get in the way mm -hmm. of tougher enforcement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important that we come back and we hit pretty hard on uh, this subject and say this is an area that we all need to be uh, vested in because if as adults we're not going to stand up and say this is wrong and this is problematic, uh, you know, we can't expect that children are going to. So, you know, it's all fine and well to talk about the civil, liberty, civil liberties and rights of adults, but I don't know what place that has when we're talking about child protection and what's going on within these images. Um, surrounding the severe abuse of children and people getting pleasure off of sexual gratification and pleasure off of um, watching that. Yeah, when, when civil liberties become the private weapons of pedophiles, the conversation ceases to interest me at all in terms of mm -hmm. civil liberties. It's not what I it's not what I think of when I think of civil liberties. I think of people having a right to vote, people having uh, dignity. There's no dignity in this at all. Mm -hmm. And I understand that theoreticians get all excited about. Uh, about uh, defending pedophiles. You know, they'll say, well, we're not defending their behavior, we're just defending their choice to have a behavior. And that somehow uh, that's supposed to be very, very highfalutin. Let me get from that to what's practical. What can people do to help stop this? What's your organization doing to help Canadians stop it? Well, we're set up as Canada's tip line to report the online sexual exploitation of children. So what we're designed to do is to be a clearinghouse in this country. We work with child exploitation units, so law enforcement right across Canada. We take reports from Canadians, assess the nature of that complaint, and then forward it into the appropriate jurisdiction. Certainly the issue becomes complex because the internet is international in nature. So in Canada we have some very stringent laws around child pornography, but when you're talking about the internet, you're dealing with the borderless nature of it and acknowledging the fact that if we receive a complaint from a Canadian, the likelihood that that content even is sitting on a server in Canada is not terribly high. So it becomes a complex issue and one that our agency is playing a major role in Canada in supporting Canadians and trying to uh, assist in, uh, in identifying these kids and getting this content off the internet. And if people need more information, they just log on very easy, cybertip.ca. Yeah, and there's an online report form. I mean, that's how most Canadians would report the information to us. But Canadians need to play an active role in this. If they're concerned about an adult's behavior and interaction with children, you know, it's not a stretch to uh, suggest that if you're go you have an interest in sexually harming a child, that in conjunction with that, you might have an interest in photographing it. Signe Arneson, thanks very much for what you're doing. Okay, thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Signe Arneson.